Hello, dear audience. We are back with our discussions around Feast of Healthy Thoughts, and we are talking about Mother Teresa's prayer. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. We have discussed all other four lines, and we are going to speak about the last line. The fruit of service is peace. When we speak about peace, I remember what she said in a different occasion about peace. Some people asked her to come for a campaign against war, and she said, I will not go against war, but I will go for peace. Peace was very important for her, and we know from her life that she did many things for peace. And the way to go to the peace, according to her, is the service. Now, I don't exactly understand what she means by this. How can service bring to peace in the individual's life and in general in the world? Because we know that her understanding of peace was not only in the peace of the individual person, but peacemaking in the entire world. So how does the service work in this aspect? How does the service make, create peace in the whole world? We know that Christ told his disciples to go and serve. He himself served, he said, this is what I do to you, you do to the others. And our relationship with God is service. We serve God. Saint Paul says to the people who are in a position of being a servant, serve your masters peacefully, do what you are supposed to be doing. And in some cases we can see that this has been abused that the servants would not get the credit that they deserved. But from Christian perspective, Paul suggests this. Now there are different dimensions to this. We'll try to enlighten many of them as much as we can. Thank you, Dr. Kiyaki, for being with us. And this is, I think, is the hardest. The other ones are more ideological. We can say that we love, or we can say well, we're praying, and hopefully we'll have faith. But here she goes to a very practical thing, service. How does that lead to peace when on a human way of thinking it might even lead to one's annihilation? And so as we enter this topic, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, what a gift and privilege this has been for me to have this conversation with you. That we are, number one, really having a conversation. We come in with notes, we come in thinking about this, praying about this, meditating on this. Uh, reflecting on this, doing some research, and then we come here, we just start to talk. <laughs> and so this really is a conversation, hopefully, with the listener at the table with us as we share and converse. And the second, that this is really a blessing for me, and that this has been helpful for me in thinking more concretely what it means for me to be living my life in my body at this time in my life as I try to live with some measure of integrity with who I am and what I do. This is something we talked about earlier, with identity, who we are in the presence of God, and our vocation, how we serve God, what our mission in life is in our everyday existence. In addition to this, I had flashed through my mind one of the expressions, the affirmations the Lord uses in the Beatitudes when He says, blessed are the peacemakers. What does that mean when we offer ourselves as a kind of sacrifice through our service? Peace has many nuances from an Orthodox Christian perspective and from an everyday perspective. When we think of peace from an everyday perspective, we often think of peace from war. As you said in the story just now that Mother Teresa said she would come and advocate for peace. She would not come and advocate against, against war. war which is saying something. Peace is also something that we all try to cultivate, we might chase, as, especially as we grow as adults and have to deal with this noisy world with all the distractions and all the good things and bad things and the, and the tools and the toys that are at our disposal that may help us or actually get in the way of our uh, helping us because there's so much to do that we sometimes don't prioritize the way we'd like because we're so distracted. And so then we crave for peace because we're so distracted. And there's so much inner turmoil going on on the inside, be it with what we're doing or who we're seeing or who we're engaging with, that all we do is crave for peace. 
And so there's that inner peace, that serenity that we crave. Secondly, there's the kind of peace that you hinted on now that happens outside of us, that when people are combating each other, when there's a lack of that, then it's not always necessarily peace, but the hope is for healthy, nutritious relations where we are brought into communion with, with one another and at assisting the other to become a better person, whoever they're called to be. And so there's that peace that is supposed to be among us, not just within us. And as, as Orthodox Christians, both are true. And I think Mother Teresa also was pointing to both being true. And also, last layer on this, and there's many other layers, but the one that I'll highlight right now, is that peace is a person. And so that helps me from going crazy permanently. Because if I just can hold on to that fact as a Christian, that affirmation that peace is a person, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself, helps act as a kind of north star, as a kind of compass for me to sort of keep facing as I or we trudge through the everyday difficulties of, of life, where sometimes it's even hard to see that north star, but to keep trying to face in that direction. One last part, if I can say, is the sense of peace as in not necessarily just feeling it, uh, when we are in the presence of peace, capital P, when we are not just feeling it, that there is a kind of docility that comes. There's a kind of serenity. There's a kind of a mature innocence that also accompanies us with that gift of being in peace. And so what this prayer is reminding me is that while that gift of peace may not always be with us at all times, sometimes we may be in it more than we realize, even if we're feeling some turmoil on the inside. Mother Teresa's life points to that. You know, she, as you were saying earlier, maybe if not in this episode, in, the, in our previous episode, that she experienced a kind of turmoil and doubt in her life about her relationship with, uh, with God. Is this real? Is this, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And it really was a point of um, confusion for her. And hearing that, enlivens me, that if she had these experiences, as she was doing good, as somehow God was working through her anyway, through her doubts, perhaps even metaphorically speaking, raising the dead, at least by the people who are dead on the inside coming more alive in their hope that they are loved by God and they are human persons created in the image and likeness of God. If they didn't feel that before and that returns to them or is given to them, that's like raising the dead. So she was doing that in some way, in may, maybe many ways, even while she was feeling kind of confused on the inside. This is very helpful for me because to bear witness to this peace, to, to be an agent for this peace, capital P, to some have the author of peace working through me, I don't always have to be feeling it perfectly to be somehow part of that. And many people sometimes throughout the history or even in the present times, will do things in the name of God. And then the history will prove that it was wrong. They consider this as a service. And maybe this is the reason that people like Mother Teresa or many saints throughout the history have maybe had doubts about what they're doing. Is this the right thing I'm doing or not? But some people will do things in the name of God and they will think that this is the right thing, I'm doing the best things. There is no better thing that can be done and here comes the history, shows that this wasn't the right thing to do. It's not necessarily being right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's being an agent of peace. And as you say this, uh, to be an agent of peace, the flip side of peace is, at least on the human side, is humility. Our being right-sized in the presence of God. The first line of what is now called the serenity prayer is, Lord, grant me the serenity, which is another word for serenity is peace. So, Lord, grant me the serenity or the peace to accept the things I cannot change. Next line is, courage to change the things I can. And number three, is, and the wisdom to know the difference. And so when we come in with that stance of, Lord, grant me the serenity, the peace, to accept the things I cannot change, we're coming in with our hands up in surrender and in offering of our whole selves and our whole lives to to Christ our God and let Christ work through us. Why? 
because we don't have all the answers. We, we, any, any kind of holding that we do, that we have, we take control. And so when we control in a way that becomes God without being God, we can make mistakes. And so we can even be doing the right thing and still be wrong. And let me give you an example from church history. Historically, the church suffered for centuries with the issue of icons and images. How do we give glory to God? Do we use icons or not? And when you read the history books through the early centuries of the church, there were very good people. There were saints and sinners on both sides of the issue. Mm -hmm. And in the end, when icons were finally brought back to the life of the church with joy, even Patriarch Methodius, uh, Saint Methodius now, together with Empress Theodora, who were leading the processions of this joyful celebration of the restoration of icons in the life of the church, did it with joy and celebration, but not in a way to be provocative in a shaming way to the good people who are on the other side. Mm -hmm. And so that's saying something to us as Christians, that we may even be on the wrong side of something. And in the long run, in God's eyes, it's not necessarily if we're on the right side or the wrong side of a certain issue. It's how are we living within that issue? How are we dealing with that? How do we engage our brothers and sisters as we grow in our understanding of this truth in a way that it doesn't become a God versus the real God, if I'm making sense? The expression that Christ uses, I came to establish not peace, but sword. These are very hard words that you're saying. Mm -hmm. First of all, the, I know in my experience people who were, are misunderstanding those words and who are abusing those words. And so oftentimes people may quote that line from Scripture as a way to self-promote their own self-righteous arrogance, you know, that, that they're holier than thou, and I am going to go do this, and you know, you are not of God or not so much of God, and so this I need to say some of the bad stuff first, that, that this line from Scripture has been used and is used across Christianity, inclu including Orthodox Christianity, as a way to promote a particular application of some kind of Christian teaching which may or may not be correct, or maybe it's, an ex it's imbalanced and it's very extreme, so that the person who is using this, who's wielding this expression, doesn't have to feel any remorse for the feelings and the persons that they've hurt. So mm -hmm. this is happening a lot, and I'm angry with that. Now, when this is happening in a way that's authentic, this is happening in a way that's authentic. Paradoxically, this is, these are exceptions that are frequent that prove the rule. That for the sake of peace, one has to sacrifice and suffer. And so when persons are witnessing to or worshiping a lesser God, and that is their God. And others are saying, I can't go this direction with you. I cannot fly with you. There was a 12-step therapist who's very well respected now, and he would say in his television interviews, all of the ducks can be flying one direction, but that direction could be to their own destruction. You cannot, even if all of the ducks are flying in that direction, you cannot fly with them. Even if you have to sort of turn around and fly another direction that you think is more true, all of the duckies cannot be flying. You know, you, you do not fly with them. It's to your own destruction. And so this is the kind of thinking I think is under, underpinning the Lord's instruction. You cannot fly with them. It's going to hurt. It's mm -hmm. going to tear you apart for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of love. The authentic love, living in the Lord, growing in the Lord, is different than all the other gods that call for our attention. We cannot fly with them. It's very, very painful when we have to, it's violent. It feels violent to separate ourselves from people we love who are flying that direction. When I was very young, when I first started thinking about God, I could also see this happening around me, that people would start provoking their relatives or their even immediate relatives, parents, sisters, and brothers, and you don't believe in God, I do. This was ha happening both ways. When somebody became Christian, especially in an atheistic society, they were attacked. They would stand out in a society, or their group would stand out in a society. And that would give them strength, actually, to stay where they are. Start criticizing back. Well, you don't believe in God. I do this, I do that. Look at me, look at yourself. 
uh, look at your life, what you're doing. So I'm, I'm living such a holy life and I want to be with God. Uh, being with God is the only way to be. In my case, when I was criticizing my father that you do this and you do that, you don't do this and that, that I do. When I grow up and I have more responsibilities, I have a family like he did at that time. I have children that he had to take care of at that time. I realized that there are many things that I can't do because of other responsibilities that are not that great. I have to do them because I have to. And I can't do things that I please to do. And I feel bad for criticizing someone for that. I understand them much better now. This is what I have experienced as a misunderstanding of this, that, oh yeah, that's true, Christ said that I'm going to separate you from your parents. God knows our hearts, and when we do that, you know, some of that's that immature wanting to be at the front of the line, and I'm not saying it's not wrong, mm -hmm. but it's a little different when it's out of immaturity, that we can't hurt feelings, that we can't do damage when we do that. We do, but looking at that in hindsight, now both of our hearts, as I hear this, I can't speak for your heart, but I bet you're feeling some softness as you talk about this, because there's more awareness what this must have been like for your dad growing up. And so I'm sure your dad knew that you're also talking out of your youth and your mm -hmm. exuberance. And at the same time, but this is a good lesson, because sometimes speaking up is, a, it's authentic and it's life-giving and, and it's the right witness to truth that has to be done. And sometimes it's speaking up and it's more, we're getting off on it. We are, oh, look at me. I'm speaking in public. I'm in front of a whole audience. I'm on television. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say, I'm on television. And so it takes on an end in itself. And then when that happens, that becomes a kind of idol and, and God might use that to his purposes, but at the same time regarding our relationship with God, you know, it's not doing much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I think when it comes to these kinds of situations, what comes to my mind are words quoting from Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, who would say, become a gospel, mm -hmm. become a gospel. And a similar teaching, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi would say something like, preach the gospels and use words if you have to. <laughs> 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 and, and so, there are ways to radiate the gospel that words don't always have to be said. In fact, sometimes radiating the gospel might be more powerful than just what we say. One expression that Mother Teresa used, uh, which actually relates to the second part of her prayer, which was that I am a pencil in God's hand. She completely refused to apply any of the things that she did to herself. I'm a pencil. Whatever God does, I just obey. That's a great thing to be. Sometimes it can even give pride to somebody say, well, I'm in God's hands and God is using me, look at me. In her case, I think it was completely different. She just did whatever she could and... It was part of her doxology. The other thing I wanted to say in the previous episode, but I think I saved it for this episode, is this prayer, both parts, that you, this new section that you, you're adding in our time together, in the previous episode and this episode, this prayer uh, is also a prophecy. You can't prophesy unless you are a pencil mm -hmm. and let God work through you. St. John Chrysostom said something similar many centuries earlier where he would tell his clergy, when you give sermons, don't get all puffed up. Don't get full of yourselves with the eloquence of your words or the topic, the topic at hand. What you need to be is to make way for God's voice to work through you, be the instrument through which God's music flows. Mm -hmm. And so there's a similar parallel between what you, you're saying about Mother Teresa and what St. John Chrysostom many centuries ago was saying and in instructing his clergy especially in how to bear witness to the gospel, that don't get puffed up, it's not about you. But even so, we are changed when we allow ourselves to be supple, and humble, and we surrender to the love of God, where He sustains us, changes us, as He works through us at the same time. Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, and I think Kali Swear would often quote the Fathers saying, it's kind of like the human being being a piece of iron, that when the iron is placed in a kiln or very, very hot heat, it also takes on the same brightness of the fire. Yes. 
it doesn't become fire, although it is imbued with the fire and full of the fire, it still is what it is. It can start fire. And <laughs> it can start fire, exactly. <laughs> and so, in a sense, that's what we are called to be like, that we become maybe our best selves imbued with the fiery love of God. Now, what is a prophecy? Two things. Number mm -hmm. one, most of us think of a prophecy in terms of telling the future. There is an element of truth to that. Sometimes mm -hmm. there is something, an event, we think of scriptures and prophesying events that will happen in the future. That is part of the meaning of the word to prophesy. But the, at the heart of the word, it is to point to what God's will is for his people right now in the moment, which is the eternal now. So that's why the eternal now and the future and the past are all one in God, but the right now in the moment. So the prophet, when he or she prophesies, is bearing witness to the love of the living God for God's people or and that context in that moment, most of the time. That's, that's the meaning. And so she is prophesying with this prayer. Because to say that the fruit of service is peace, for me, that's the hardest line to swallow. Because when I serve, when I do work, oftentimes, most of the work that I do, if I, try, if I do it well, there'll come a point after a minute or a year or 10 or 15 years when I'm regretting that I went down that direction. <laughs> I am regretting that I might be doing a great job. I'm not saying there aren't elements to it, but at some point, I'm sure this happens to a lot of people, that we're doing the right, th we're fortunate and blessed to be doing the right thing. But then we start doubting ourselves, am I doing the right thing? Because we're met with failure, we're, we're met with misunderstanding, we're met with people who might take our work, change it, and run off with it in different ways. We're kind of sometimes, by serving, we're kind of like left in the lurch, unable to speak to the failure of our lives. And so sometimes, on the human level, service, even if we're doing it well, there'll be some kind of failure. And so I don't see that in the prayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but instead I see the fruit of service is peace. And so it helps me when I remember that peace is a person, that peace will hold us as we're broken, and that we are in the center of the palm of peace's hand when we are pieces mm -hmm. <laughs> and broken. Uh, in, in, in those cir circumstances that life leads us, when we serve and serve well, and things don't go the way we planned. Yes, it has to be difficult, I think. It has to be the service that leads to peace as you approach the peace being a person. Christ says many times that the gate is narrow, or the path that takes to me is narrow. It's difficult. Take your cross and follow me. Now, there can be wrong crosses like you mentioned before, but it is still a cross. It doesn't matter what you're doing. There has to be a cross. There has to be a difficulty. But what I understood from your explanation is that when you are serving and you're facing all the difficulties, you're saving, facing all the failures, all the obstacles, then you need the peace who is the person to come and comfort you because there is no way to stay serving and not have Christ with you. Otherwise, you will just leave. Well, the flip side of peace, and we said earlier, might be humility, but we could easily uh, change that to another word, which is trust. Because humility and trust are deeply interconnected and deeply interrelated. You can't really be humble without trusting God, again, the surrender. And trust is a kind of surrender. <laughs> In fact, sometimes when people have been abused, Sometimes the word surrender is a little bit too hard to deal with because when the abuser makes someone surrender in a way that's inauthentic to them, what they should be doing, they should be living a free life as a human being and instead they're being oppressed. Surrender has a bad word. So people surviving abusive situations often respond better to the word trust, and that's good. Right? So if we look at humility, not in terms of being humiliated the way we are when we're being oppressed, but in terms of being right-sized and supple in the presence of God, trusting God, and doing the work you know, a minute at a time that we're called to do is very different. It's a very different demeanor. I'd like to tell you a story about someone who confided this from her confession to me. Mm -hmm. And she said that she was exhausted from the kind of work that she was doing. She was also doing work for the church and doing something for miraculous, I think, for, for a number of years. And she was starting to get burned out. And she said to me that in confession, she said to 
her confessor, Father, you know, I feel like I've been climbing one mountain after the next. And on each mountain I climb, it gets higher and higher and harder and harder. And now I've climbed so many mountains. I look back, all I see is mountains. I don't see home. I don't see, I don't <laughs> see, I don't see my village. I don't see green grass and pastures. I just see, you know, I've climbed so high, there's no vegetation. And all I see before me is rocks. And I'm climbing and I'm afraid. I don't see an end. And my fear is I'm going to just, in my fatigue, just drop on my knees someplace further up, not too far from here, and f forget why I'm here and die. And you know what she said, he said? Sounds like you're doing it about right. <laughs> 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 like, oh my gosh. So maybe she was hanging on the right cross <laughs> for this story. But this is saying something, a little bit of a nuance to the fruit of service is peace, that in the end, there will be hanging on a cross, hopefully the right cross, and that we do expire into something beyond us that we don't understand, which is the open palm loving hand of the loving God. Uh, this is why this prayer is also a prophecy. She is saying what is true now, what is true before us. Remembered again that we have talked about before, the story about that Danko. He also takes his heart out and he knows that he's going to die and serves all the way through and then at the end he disappears. And I think it's into peace because the story says the flowers grew. Even people did not notice that he disappeared but the flowers grew and there is uh, I actually went back and read the story again and it said that, that there is a kind of ritual now when they f see these kind of flowers in the fields, there are specific kind of flowers and people remember him. So that, that's where it, this flower started from the sacrificial love of, of this person. But I need to add, I have no idea what the person listening to our conversation right now is thinking, thinking, these Orthodox, you know, they're really a lot of fun to be with. <laughs> that here you talk about is sacrifice and death, and there you go, you die, you know, you die splat, you know, there you go, flowers are left behind, or, or uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> At a girl, you die on the mountain, mm -hmm. you, you, you're doing well. But there's an element of the resurrection and the crucifixion of the Lord are two sides of the same coin to be in the Lord, to be in the resurrected love of the Lord. At the baptismal service, there's the hymn that goes back to the, the establishment of Christianity. Those who've been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. And so all baptized Christians are baptized into, become one with His death and resurrection. Does that mean we have to be crucified on that particular cross? No, that was done once and for all. But we share in that cross. And somehow that cross is reverberated in our personal lives, wherever we may be, to bring life to others. That does not mean miracles don't happen. Miracles do happen. That does not mean healing doesn't happen. Healings do happen. People come to themselves in the presence of the living God. And that's a good thing, and that we want that. <laughs> At the same time, there's always more life after this life. That is the fundamental optimism that in a paradoxical way is also present with us every moment of, of the day that we affirm as Orthodox Christians. I want to tell one story again from Metropolitan Anthony's life. He says that when he was in the war as a doctor, there was this person who was wounded very badly and he knew that he's dying. And at one point he opened his eyes and he said that he's dying too. He realized himself that he's dying. And Anthony said, what can I do for you? He said, Father, or doctor, I feel lots of fear. And he said, why? Because I'm away from my family, from my village, from my mother, and I'm dying somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and I don't know what's going to happen if I die. And Anthony said, well, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid. I'm here next to you, and I promise I'll send your letters to your family so they will know where you died, how you died, that you were brave, you were wounded, fighting the enemy. And the most important thing, he said, because you're not sure where you're going, I'll hold your hand and you will start getting weaker. And at one point you will not feel my hand anymore, but you will feel that Christ is taking over for me. So don't be afraid. This kind of relates to this line. I think that this person was in service. He was doing what he was supposed to do. 
And then it came to a point where he kind of got broken. The service took him to the last drop of his blood and Metropolitan helped him to find the peace, to go to the next level, to kind of get rewarded for his service, to get to peace. And it's not easy to be wounded, to be so young, and realize that your life ended because somebody is fighting against your nation and you have to be a soldier and be there and all you did is maybe shoot a couple people and then you got shot and that's the end of your life. And so in this, in this situation I think is where a person needs to understand that there is something greater beyond that and it's possible to reach that peace. And how important every relationship is. That's a beautiful story. I wonder what it felt like for the undercover monk to hold this young soldier's hand those last few minutes and to be with him through those last few minutes, how many minutes that was, and that the instructions that he gave him, you'll hold my hand and you'll get weaker and weaker, you'll feel my hand, and then come to a point where you won't feel my hand anymore, and then you'll be in God's hands. To be that agent of love for the soldier was also an act of sacrifice for the undercover monk, mm -hmm. uh, then the doctor, uh, <laughs> Metropolitan Anthony Bloom. And so there are opportunities for us in our lives to be able to be the undercover monk, <laughs> to be persons who, in those quiet nuances of life where no one else is paying attention, and this, this young man was dying. No, everybody else was too busy fighting the war. Everybody else was too busy d doing what they needed to do, and here he was. Helping the ones that had a chance of surviving right. and living this one who doesn't have a chance. He's, he's going to die anyways. And, and so by those priorities, he had no value. And so the Metropolitan was the whole world at that moment for him, yeah. for, the, for the young soldier. And, and for us listening, for us talking, to peacefully have our radar up, how we can be of service in these small ways where the whole universe is present. I think this is what Metropolitan Anthony Bloom was talking about. This is what Mother Teresa is talking about. I'll share the story that happened with me. We have a new manager and things are changing very rapidly and there is conflict between the assistants and him. In all of this, there's also misunderstanding between the assistant. And I was watching this from the side and at one point I noticed one thing that whenever they help each other they require the favor back. I decided that I'm going to put an experiment. I'm going to do as much as I can, as many favors as possible and as easy as possible so they don't even notice that I'm doing a favor. And I kept the experiment until I started feeling that people are changing. In my heart, in my mind, I knew that this is an experiment. I'm doing this for a reason. And even if I'm taken for granted, I won't mind because I know why am I doing it. But recently, I was <laughs> on vacation and my boss texted me and said, you are off on sa Saturday? I thought that I was supposed to be off on Saturday. And I'm in the middle of my vacation and I need that extra day to rest. It made me very upset. <laughs> and I texted him back and I said, well, you told me that you're okay with a Saturday. And so I took it off. He didn't answer. And then the next day he texted me again. He says, well, it's my son's birthday Saturday. And I want a day off. Or can you come a little bit early or cover a couple hours so I can go home early? I felt that he was feeling bad from pulling me back from my vacation. But then I also realized that I, at one point I lost my principle and I felt abused. I'm on vacation, why are you bothering me? So this is another dimension that I was thinking, well, I'm with my family, why would I take my time off from my family and give it to the company or to you? But the other side of it is that if it is my principle that I unconditionally will be available for anybody who needs help, is there a boundary? Is there a point where I can say, no, I, from this on, I can't do it anymore? If that was the case, then it wouldn't be unconditional principle and it wouldn't change people. That's what I'm, my thoughts are. Now, this is kind of like a service. 
and at one point it disturbed my peace and uh, I realized it later that it was just a, you know a minute or so but still it's a, it's a example <laughs> it's a beautiful story because you noticed by your unconditional love just by using the respecting the regulations there are we can talk another time about boundaries because I think it's an important mm -hmm. thing and so unconditional does unconditional love mean there's no boundaries oh no unconditional love means there are boundaries mm -hmm. okay so that's another story but that your behavior was changing has been changing the culture of your team that you work with and the difficulty of changing a culture that's one of the things we started at the beginning of our conversations regarding Mother Teresa's prayer the issue of dealing with indifference. That's what you were dealing with at work. Why should you change things? Don't give them anything more than you have to give them. And so there's a, a lack of love slash indifference in, the, in that culture that you're talking about. And by you being consistent and being true, you kind of freed up the love that is there amongst the team members. And the indifference has changed to care. People mm -hmm. care. And so in a sense, in a much larger way, this is what happened with Mother Teresa, that Mother Teresa, it was not just the good that she did. It was not just the reaching out and seeing her brothers and sister human beings as brothers and sisters and rescuing them from the garbage where they were thrown and treating them like brothers and sisters. That, in a sense, is just the mechanical part, and that's plenty, you know, the weight, the work part. I think the harder part of her witness was the indifference of the society, that there was layer upon layer of assumptions by everybody, perhaps even the people themselves that were being thrown away, of not even valuing themselves, that believing these people were garbage, and that the whole culture was in a sense an extra weight on her and on her brothers and sisters, all the people that became brothers and sisters to her in this ministry, to carry that weight of the cultural indifference. And there are spiritual ramifications to that indifference. There are vibrational, I'm sorry if I'm sounding a little out there, but there's a vibrational element to all of this lack of care. How many of us have entered a room where we go in and we just don't like the feeling of the room? And it's basically because of what's happening with the people in the room or someone in the room that's maybe so negative and toxic that they are sucking the life out or just feels wrong or bad to be in, the, in that situation. Well, she was dealing with a whole culture that was devaluing human life. And so to awaken that culture in a way that respected their religious orientations, may I add, to their own indifference, that these are human beings, these are brothers and sisters, is an amazing feat. And in the end, that can only happen by the love of God, even though she, had to, she felt so much of that weight. The change did not happen through her. It happened through her, and yet it, it did not happen because of her, that somehow she was like that pencil, mm -hmm. or like that wind instrument that would play the life-giving music of the love of God to to be heard and taken in by everybody around. And so in a sense, your small story at work has a, a full germ of completeness that's very similar to, in a much, much bigger way, what happened with Mother Teresa on, on many, many levels. Thank you, Presbytera. We are running out of time. We have only maybe five minutes. Thank you for 10 now conversations we had on this small prayer. And we brought up many other thoughts that were kind of germinated from these words that she has used. As I said, I would love to have another conversation around the most important, I think, aspect of the prayer, because this second edition of each line tells us that the pencil cannot write by itself. If the pencil is sitting on a desk, it's useless. Somebody has to take it and write, has to sharpen it maybe or have a paper to write on. So th all these things she understood, and there is this second edition, and I will remind the audience what it is. She wants God to teach her to pray, or to teach us to pray, she says, help us to believe, guide us to love, strengthen us to serve, and lead us to peace. So teaching is necessary when we are praying. We, don't, we need to know how to pray. Christ himself taught his disciples how to pray. They asked him how to pray, and he differentiated what 
the authentic prayer is, what the cr true prayer is, and what's not, or help us to believe. I believe, and Lord, help my unbelief. Help unbelief. Guide us to love and strengthen us to serve. Service is, as we said, a very hard thing to do, and we need God's uh, strengthening. And finally, somebody needs to lead us to peace, like Anthony led, it, led that soldier to peace. Uh, thank you, and we'll probably discuss this next time. Thank you, dear audience. Have a good day.